Jill, can you hear us? I can now. I can now. There was no there sound. Was no sound. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're here tonight to discuss uh, the volunteer fire firefighters, ambulance workers, and senior tax exemptions. And there have been some new developments. Uh, could you tell us about those? Now with the now firefighters, with the firefighters. Um, just with the uh, legislation proposed for next year for the senior citizens. Um, they may change how we calculate the income. And um, I outlined that in an email. So they may automatic, we may not have an option of adopting the $50,000 minimum that might be enacted into legislation um, without any other options for sliding scales. We drew, um, actually, I worked with John's office and we have all the information ready for the firefighters exemption. Um, I did send out emails to each fire district and I am waiting for a response to see approximately how many volunteers they have so that I could give you a number of um, how many residents may qualify. Um, I'm still waiting on the report back from that. Um, can you go through, shouldn't we have to ask this, but can you go through what you went through on the email about the owners no longer identified as husband and wife? Um, sure. I hesitate to do that only because this is, if that's, if that legislation is passed, that would be changed. But right now to go through all that and have the residents listen to that, they may become confused because until it's enacted into legislation, it's not part of the law, which is, I did put that in the email to you. And, you know, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you want me to go over here. I mean, they changed the, they changed the wording of the law so that it's not a husband and wife anymore. It's a married couple. Um, they changed the definition, they, if this passes, they will have changed the definition of siblings. So there could be more people that qualify um, the income scale would only be at the $50,000 minimum. Um, and then instead of calculating income for low income for every senior, for all their taxable and non-taxable, it would just be their gross, their gross adjust, adjusted gross income, less any IRA distribution. And then the town would have the option of, um, counting all of the social security or just the taxable portion of the social security. Those are the, that's the proposed legislation. Um, just, you know, I wanna make it clear that that's not how it is now. So when our seniors are asking questions, this does tend to confuse them. So I just wanna, nothing's changed. We won't know until um, the bill goes through the assembly. This was for planning purposes. Uh, you know, I, I'm giving you all the information I have so that you can make the decision that you feel best. So that's why I'm giving you the email. I, I think it's a little premature to present it publicly, but um, you know, it, but I wanted to put the information in your hands. So uh, when, when can we adopt um, this new law to start at least for next year? So if, if you want to continue on with the income scale and adopt the minimum 50,000, you can do that. We can um, call for the public hearing and then we can um, change the local law. So, um, you know, I just need, I need to know if you need to, if you'd like to move forward on that, but given the changes for next year, we may not have that option, but if you still want to go through with the income scale and, and adjust, amend the income scale, we can do that. I just need the word so that, I can, you know, John needs the word actually because Anthony's drawn up all the paperwork to be put through. For he's he's done the resolution for the public hearing. He's done the resolution for the law change. So we're just we're actually waiting on the go ahead from you. Great. Um, any other council members have questions? What are your feelings on this? Because we I I have a question, Jill. 
Um, yeah. When you're talking about the Social Security and the way um, it's figured in as to if we're going to tax the whole amount or you're going to tax the taxable amount. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify that, uh, when you file your tax return, um, seniors typically, if they if they make a certain amount of money, a portion of their um, social security becomes taxable. So that would be included in the adjusted gross income. Right now, as it stands for the low income, we have to count the, the entire amount of social security that's received in a year. So the board will have the option if this legislation passes to say, we're fine with just taking the taxable or we, we wanna take the full amount of social security. So that's pretty much the only option that you have when you adopt it, you don't get to choose an income scale anymore. It's it's all there. I think they're trying to mirror the the way that we calculate income for the enhanced star because it's it's the adjusted gross minus any IRA distribution. So um, and and in light of that, you know, like I said, there were, the report from New York State said there was over five thousand people that had adjusted gross incomes that were under the fifty eight thousand. Um, 50, you know, the, the $58,400 limit that would qualify for something. Um, we didn't know if, if those people would qualify because we, we count total income. Well, if, if the law has changed, they're all going to qualify because it's adjusted gross, just like for enhanced star, we're, we're not counting all the taxable, we're count, we're not counting any non-taxable, we're just counting the taxable income. So that, that would be a pretty substantial number of people who will qualify. Anybody else, any board members? Um, what are your feelings about it? I, I, Jill, if we didn't do anything though, we don't know for sure if the, the state is going to do anything. And so if we pass something this year, it'll affect our seniors next year. If That's correct. State, it might be another two years, right? They might not. Um, well, it, it could be, or if they pass it, then we would have to, it depends on when it's signed into law. If it's signed into law in December, that means they're going to, um, you know, that we would, we could apply it to that next March, um, March, 2024 filing. Um, again, a lot of that's out of our hands. So to, you know, full disclosure here is it, it could, they could either vote for it. And depending on when they do that, it could be in time for next year, or we would have to wait the additional year, or they could vote it down. So those are some of the options that we're looking at. If we do nothing, um, then we, we would keep the income scale where it is, or or if you choose, we can uh, adopt the new income scale now, you know, as a, you know, to cover just in case that legislation doesn't go through. Because um, I know there's um, many municipalities through New York State that are fighting it, because it's, it, it, it's a huge uh, shift of the tax burden to people who don't have exemptions, who, you know, they get the star, but they don't, there's nothing else for them. There's no, um, you know, there's, they're not disabled or things like that. So there's been some pushbacks throughout the state because of that. So it just depends on what's the best, you know, what's the best decision for the town. And I think for our town, because we have a lot of, uh, um, low to mod seniors, I, I don't see how we can wait and not do this, at least to have them start getting it next year if there's kind of some questions in the state. But that's only my opinion. So Council Member Noya? Yeah, the, we're talking about the upper income limit. So just the way I understand this, if somebody's at $50,000 or more, they would not be eligible for the exemption. But if they're at 49900 they would get a certain percentage off, correct? As if we use the 50,000 breaking point. No, actually, $50,000 is the minimum. So at $50,000, you get 50% off. And then it would go to 45% between a certain range, all the way up the top of the income scale is $58,400. They call it the $50,000 income scale. However, that if you make $50,000, that means you're gonna qualify. And you can right make up to 58,400. Um, and right now our, our number is what is it around 34 or 36,000? 37 nine, I believe. Okay, a little higher than that. Yeah. And we can go to any number between 37 nine and 50, right? 
Yes, right now. Um, well, that I'd have to check on. Um, I can research that for you, but I think the next step up for us would be the 50,000 minimum. Um, so I, you know, we could look at the next number, I think, I, I think is the 50, I think we, we hit the top with 37. Um, but just two years ago, I think it was, we were at 19.8. So we've jumped it substantially over the last couple of years. We went from 19.8 to 26.4 and now we're at 37. So 37, um, four, I think, but either way, um, I think the next scale up would be the 50,000 minimum, uh, 58,400 maximum. And also too, with the new legislation, if that were to pass, um, with the IRA income, they don't, they don't, right now we don't count IRAs as income. We only count the earnings on that. So we treat it like a savings account because any money that a person has in an IRA is not income to them. But when, when they have gains on it, such as interest, um, dividends or things like that, that the state considers income. Um, so when you're, when you take that out of the equation, there's going to be, I, I think you're going to see a, a large number of seniors that are going to qualify. Um, if we increase it now, some of those people won't qualify because we're still looking at IRA. But once you take the IRA income out of that, um, I think you're gonna see a pretty good number of people being eligible. I'll send you the exact figures on the, um, on the income, the income scales. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the minimum is 50,000, the top is 57.4. Uh, yeah. I, From that last look. email sent us. Okay. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but um, yeah. So I will check into it to see if is are you interested in um, a level between thirty, oh. the current one, and fifty? Can you just hold on because uh, Council Member Pilarski has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Not so much a question, but a comment. Um, I personally agree with the supervisor on this. I'd like to address this, you know, as this body, rather than waiting on the state to make a decision and, and whether they do or don't, we have an opportunity here to address it and um, help many seniors with this. So I, I'd rather address this as this governing body rather than waiting on the state to make a decision for us. Yeah. Okay, go, jo go ahead, Joe. You were talking about getting more data for us? Or? Um, yeah, I can I can get some information. Are you, uh, Councilman Polarski, are you interested in in the scale at the minimum of fifty thousand, or, or would you prefer something between the fifty thousand and the thirty seven, if that's possible? I'd like to see what options we have and what impact that's okay. going to make on those that are not seniors as well. So there's a balance there, but um, right. because obviously the tax burden is going to be shifted to others, so I'd like to see what that entails and how much of that tax burden would be shifted to those that are not seniors. I'm also interested in a limit between 37 and 50. Okay. I'll do some work on it this week. So before the next meeting, um, I'll make sure that I send you an email with that information. And then um, we can go ahead with the public hearing. I can make that adjustment to, I can at, work with Anthony to make the adjustment if we decide um, to choose a different income scale. But as it's set now, um, we, we have everything drawn up. We just have to submit it for the agenda for next time. I have a Linda Hammer, our council member Hammer. Has a okay. Question. I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So if this year we either do nothing or increase the limit somewhere between the 37, nine and 50, if we put it somewhere in between there, but then next year, um, the state passes this, do we automatically get bumped up to the 50 then? Or I believe any new legislation would ha would override that. That's something I'd have to check on. I think I do I think they're what they're proposing now is it's an actual change in the law. So that would override anything that's in place now. It would take out all those variables of um, non-taxable income and you know so it, it, the the law would actually be rewritten. So we would have to adopt it as it's written. And um, do you have any, does anybody have any information or um, questions for Jill about the firemen, firefighters and ambulance workers exemptions? 
we have to do a public hearing for that or is that automatic? Yes. No, that's a public hearing. It's a brand new exemption. So that's a little bit different, but it still has to be a public hearing. Um, I did send you the, the information that Anthony sent. He, he did the um, resolutions for that and uh, he did a really nice job. He, so in the resolution, it does say that we are gonna qualify them after two years of service and that we, um, I think we're going to opt into a lifetime exemption once they have 20 years of service. Mm -hmm. It mirrors what I think the county and the village are doing. So we're all going to be the same. So there's not too much of a yeah. difference. Yeah. It, yeah. it makes it, it does make it easier for the residents and honestly for my office too, because um, you, you should see the scale, the information we have because you, a person can have the same, the same exemption, but if it's in a different school district or in the village, it has different, it has different things that qualify them. So um, I think, I think this is more resident friendly by having it the same. Um, it's, it's, two years rather than five. So that's a benefit to the, the resident. And um, I, I think the 20 years of service granting them lifetime status is also a, a good move. I think that's, um, so I, I, I think we have the best of what's offered, what our options are. Any other, yeah, go ahead, Linda. Um, I had a couple of questions. I was reading through that and I do have a couple of questions, but I think it's something we're going to have to discuss with our attorney. Um, there were a couple, you know, differing things in there, which I didn't understand, which was one of them that says they have to live in the district that they serve as a firefighter in. They have to live in the district and in the town where they get the exemption. Yes, that that's the part of the law. That's not something we can opt into. They're in the district. They have to be in their district. Because I yes. know, I mean, from back in the day, I knew that there were firefighters that DQ had picked up that boundaries were way the heck up to Union Road. So they were technically in Cheektowaga. How do you handle, how do we handle that? No, um, we would, we would have to verify their residency. And then when the fire district sends us a list of who's eligible, we'd have to check within that fire district to see if their residence was in that district. Okay. So does everybody want to at least move forward with the firemen exemption law? Call for public hearing? Yeah, I think we should move forward on both. But to me, I still would like to know the numbers of how many firefighters we have. Well, I, mean, all right, so I think there's a ballpark like 450, 400 or so um, that are active. But then when we start totaling in those that are lifetime, 20 years plus and all that, that all starts to climb up and add also. So. Yes, I want the ball to keep moving forward. I I'm think just this not is great. sure, right, if we'll have it ready for the next meeting. Then, yeah. Right. We still have to look at the numbers. So, Brian, um, just just for clarification, um, whether the person's a 20 year veteran or uh, two year vet, two year service, they're still going to get 10 percent. The exemption is going to be the same for everybody. That's just what qualifies them. So. Yeah, and I'm just wondering how many though, because like I yeah. you know, like years that would be shifted to non firefighters and non, you know, seniors. So I'm just kind of ballparking. And how much of a tax impact is that gonna make? How much money are we shifting? You know, is it you know, a hundred thousand or is it two million, you know? So stuff like that to look at. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean it's all adding up. But we, uh, my feeling is we have to help these seniors because everything else is going up. Prices of food and just utilities, et cetera. Um, so if we're not helping them this way, um, we're gonna have a lot more losing their homes and not being able to make ends meet. So I think that we're all on the right track that we wanna have this done for them. and. Um, sooner the better so we have it for next year then they can start applying yeah definitely the sooner the better definitely don't want to wait on the state to make a decision no, for us let us make that decision and, and let's make it soon yeah because there's a chance what if it doesn't pass then yeah because there is like i said there is some opposition so 
you know, you, nothing's guaranteed. I just wanted to put that on the table for you. It's just to let you know that that could be coming our way too. So, but in the meantime, I will go, I will work with Anthony to put these through. I will get you the information about the um, income scales and um, in time so that it can be published and get in the paper for the next hearing, for the public hearing for next board meeting. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Do, town board resolution item next on the agenda. So uh, we do have um, actually three public hearings tonight. Um, and one is the increase and in improvement of facilities of the Consolidated Sewer District, uh, the special use permit at 465 French Road, and the special use permit at 1551 Harlem. Uh, then uh, there's a resolution on the table. It's the uh, opposition to the proposed ban on natural gas heating and appliances in New York State. There's been talk of a few amendments. We can talk about it now, but then at the regular meeting, there has to be a motion and approve the amendment, and then we approve the resolution as amended. So I, I think Linda and Brian both had some suggestions. Linda? Make sure you use your microphone. Oh. Um, let me go first. Mike and I, Council Member Jasinski and I, have been talking about this um, resolution, the opposition to the proposed ban on natural gas. Um, we've gone back and forth, back and forth, but the two of us have been able to come to an agreement, bipartisan, where we can um, make an amendment to the third paragraph that says, whereas the state's proposal is intended to help address climate change, but could create a burden on our region's working class residents. Um, and I ask that we change it to, whereas the state proposal is intended to help address climate change, climate change may affect future generations. The development of renewable and sustainable energy technology that is inexpensive and reliable therefore creating no burden on the region's working class residents. And Mike and I were able to come to an agreement on that, so I was happy to see that. Yeah, I agree because, you know, this is a bipartisan issue that we should work on. And at the end of the day, it's the end result that we're working for, and we want to be able to still heat our homes with natural gas. Okay. So you gave that language to Kim, so she'll have it when we talk about that at the meeting. And then Brian Noah? Yeah, it, you know, we're talking about uh, a proposal at the state level that's talking about the, the ban of natural gas hookups in new builds and somewhere down the line, a ban on gas appliance sales in New York. Uh, but I think it helps to set the stage about why we're even discussing such a policy. and. I don't want to go too long on this, but we have to we have to confront some of this stuff before we get into some of the real problems with the electrical grid. So please bear with me. You know, uh, if you've gone to a gas station, you see it says unleaded on the pumps, right? You know, why is that? They used to put lead in gasoline. Years and years ago, um, there's a guy named Claire Patterson, and he worked on the Manhattan Project, and he became pretty much the world expert on lead isotope analysis. And in the course of his work, he realized that lead levels in the top several feet of the ocean were a lot higher than the deep water. And he's trying to figure it out. It didn't make any sense to him. So he came to the conclusion it was because of the lead and gasoline. And for years, the oil industry was selling the idea of lead and gasoline as a clean anti-knock technology. And obviously, we know what lead does today. But it took him years and years to be getting ta to get taken seriously by Congress and the scientific community, uh, and he won that battle. We took lead out of gasoline, and when we did that, lead levels fell by 80 percent. You know, and that sh and take that over to CO2 pollution. 
We knew as early as 1896 the impact that carbon dioxide had in the atmosphere. That was a Swedish professor, professor named Svante Aranis. In 1902, the Selma Morning Post ran an article about how CO2 into the atmosphere causes issues. In 1980, or 1954, there was something published, and it reads like this, a changing concentration of dioxide, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, talking about the issues of CO2. That wasn't put out by environmental activists or the Sierra Club or a left-wing group. That was put out by the American Petroleum Institute. And in the 1960s, the science from Charles Davis Keating got us to this place where we know CO2 is causing a real problem. Even research from ExxonMobil, they published this, they had this paper in-house in 1979, documents the issue with CO2 in the atmosphere. All this happened before I was born. So the idea of CO2 causing issues to the atmosphere in large amounts is basically established fact now. And it's been settled. And the oil industry has admitted it in their own internal papers. So this is coming up because there's a recognition that CO2 causes issues. And you know, going back to what was brought up the, uh, two weeks ago, that the Earth being a source that renews itself, I, I agree with that. And all the CO2 that there ever was has ever been. But it's all been locked into the ground. And in the last 100 years, we've been shooting it up into the atmosphere. So it's a real issue that we have to deal with. And it's been discussed for decades and decades now. But we're running up against another problem, and that comes with the electrical grid. And I think that's where we're finding a lot of, of consensus. This is an article from Politico, and the title is, Renewable Projects Are Slow to Develop Amid New, New York's Climate Goals. So wind and solar projects that are being planned, a sliver of them are actually getting built. Then you look into the tra high voltage transmission lines. It takes 10 to 15 years to approve that. That's another problem. The issues of battery storage to store the wind and solar power. The technology is getting better, but that's not there yet. The electricians, we've talked about the skilled trades up here. There's a shortage of electricians. You look at the issues with the electric grid from all these different pieces that even though you have this issue with climate change where most people agree, you can see why people, reasonable people, doubt the ability of the electric grid to handle this. So looking at the resolved on this item, I agree with it. I think we can't put a date on this right now because there are, for multiple reasons, not only is not the electric grid not there to handle this, it, it can't handle it. And if you take care of two or three of those problems, you're still going to have another bottleneck. There's a high voltage transmission line in, that was running through Las Vegas. 17 years into the approval process, H2B in Oregon, they're over a decade into that approval process. Yeah, New York does it a little faster, but in so many different areas, the grid's not just ready, so I agree. Uh, I do have a couple of amendments with all that said. Which one passes now? I have, yeah, I have one, but. And the first two are very minor changes. Uh, Councilman Jasinski and I started talking about this, but uh, the conversation got off on a tangent, so hopefully we can finish that here today. Um, on the fourth where I asked, I simply wanted to add the word currently. And it says a ban on natural gas appliance and appliances and water heaters is not feasible. I, I, it's not currently feasible. You see in Canada, in Maine, in Norway, in cold weather climates, there are heat pumps all over the place. And they do work in cold weather climates. But we get pretty cold here. So uh, for us, it's not currently feasible, but it's going to be down the road. The technology, just like battery technology, just like building out the grid, just like the solar power, it's all getting better, but it's not quite there yet. So I just want to add one word, not currently feasible. On the sixth whereas, I just wanted to add the words, both affordable and. So it reads, what is more, alternatives to natural gas powered heating have yet to be proven, both affordable and reliable. Because we could rely on uh, electric power dryer. We have those around here. We've got electric stoves in our town. They're reliable. Uh, but you get to things like heat pumps and especially the hot water at electric, they're not affordable. And you compare electric to BTU, uh, and you do apples apples comparison to gas and electric prices, it's about three to one. Electric's about three times more expensive than gas. And even for folks like me who want to see us go in an environmental direction, that's just the reality you have to admit. You know, so both affordable and there. And then the last one I had, we have to think about where all the natural gas is. We consume 20% of the natural gas every year that gets us consumed in the whole world. 
and half of what's left is in Russia, Iran, and Qatar, all of our buddies, right? Uh, so the amendment reads, whereas Russia, Iran, and Qatar are home to the majority of proven worldwide gas reserves, the U.S. is the top consumer of natural gas, and the oil crisis of the 1970s is a lesson that we should reduce our fossil fuel dependence in addition to the detrimental impacts methane emissions and natural gas leaks have on our communities. So why did I start talking about lead? Because there's issues with natural gas and methane leaks in the pipes and, and methane pollution and in the gas stoves causing asthma. There's a beginning of the science on that. Right now there are people that are calling those folks about the gas stoves causing health issues. They're calling them crazy. Claire Patterson got called crazy too. In 30 years, there's going to be a consensus that, yeah, all these gas appliances in our house came with some negative health benefits. But right now, we need, a reli we need reliable and affordable energy for working class people in our town. These are very hard decisions. This is very serious stuff. And everything that I've learned about the electrical grid in the last month of digging this in, I'm not comfortable putting a check mark next to the idea of an arbitrary timeline on getting away from natural gas, even though that's the direction I like to see us go. because. For various reasons, there'd be various bottlenecks that say, well, we're going to have to scale back what we wanted to do. We should be going on the incentive route instead of the mandate route. Um, all right, so my, my comment is I'm okay with the first suggestion you made, council member, and the second. They're, they're, they're very good changes, but I don't understand why we would even put the last whereas in there. Basically, this is just a resolution telling Kathy Hochul that we're in opposition of changing so quickly, a, a ban. Whereas this statement is kind of in why we should do the ban. So it's contrary to what we're, the message I think we're trying to get across. Okay. I, last, I, I understand. I think it's a complicated issue though. I mm -hmm. think we have to recognize that there's limited resources, oil's not renewable, and while we think while, while, while there are merits to moving towards more electrification, it's got to be done in a responsible way. And that's all this really speaks to, is because at some point we'll be importing the natural gas once we get the easy natural gas out of the ground that's here in the States. You know? And we're going to be reliant on most likely Russia. I mean, they have about a quarter of the world's natural gas in there. I mean, it's a factual statement that, yeah, I understand it's contradictory in a sense, but it's just, a w it's just a whereas. I'm not proposing any changes to the resolve. I think we all agree there, but I think it's important for posterity and for people that 30, 40 years down the road might read this and think, well, you guys weren't thinking about us, to say, well, we were thinking about you. That's what Linda's amendment does, is to say, is to speak to climate change, say we're thinking about this. This is complicated mm -hmm. stuff, though. I'd like to add a comment. The reason why it's called natural gas is because that's exactly what it is. It naturally comes from the earth. Um, all the electric we currently use for our households is man-made electric. So there's a reason why it's man-made because that's where the problem lies. You know, we, we, no matter what we do, we're going to have to mine our natural resources. No matter if we make electric cars, we make electric windmills, we're still going to have to mine our natural resources. So that's why the energy company says natural gas is your best energy value because it absolutely is. Um, it's the most reliable source of heat in our area. Uh, Mr. Nowak is correct in saying Russia has the largest natural gas reserve, but the problem is, is we need to get energy dependent in our country. And the world issues really have nothing to do with what we're trying to do here in Chikawaga. I mean, I know ice naturally forms in Chikawaga. It's very cold. You know, anybody thinks Cheek Dog is warming up, go outside for two hours and come back and tell me how warm you feel. So I know I heat my house with electric, and I'm sure Mr. Nowak heats his house with uh, um, natural gas. I'm sure everybody in this room probably does. So, I mean, we can't take away something that's currently working and think we're going to build a better mousetrap because natural gas has been, it's millions of years old, and there's plenty of it to go around. The problem is, is where we outsource. America needs to become energy independent, and that's where the problem lies. And that's why they're trying to go to electric, you know, heat pumps and stuff like that. I've installed heat pumps most of my life. Is it a good idea? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. Right today, your heat pump's going to be struggling. You know, zero degrees is the cutoff. Then it goes to auxiliary heat, so it's going to either use an electric heat strip or it's going to use natural gas. So. The thing is, is the reason why it's called natural gas, 
because that's exactly what it is. It's natural, it comes out of the earth, it's natural just like flowers and everything else. So the electric that we use is man-made. And it's man-made at a factory, usually burning nuclear, coal, or some other type of re uh, resource that we mine out of the earth. So no matter what, you're still gonna have to mine your national resources. I mean, on the electrical grid side, you know, a good share of what we generate to make power is the natural gas, too. So we throw a lot of that into the grid. So honestly, part of the debate is do you want to plug in your gas or do you want to run it through a galvanized pipe? You know? Well, it's not code. You have to run it through black iron. Galvanized pipe, you only can do potable water through a galvanized pipe. And national fuel, where they get majority of our gas in our region, is here in America. They get it in the central Alabama up to the Anirondack Mountains. So our gas that heats our house is mined right here, right in our area. Any other council members? Um, so I, I'm one of the two that tabled this resolution and, and I'm gonna vote on it tonight and I'm gonna vote yes on the resolution. I'm okay with these amendments from both parties involved in making those amendments. I think my problem that I have with it is, is we're just making it too damn complicated. I mean, in the resolution, the first resolution that was submitted was a copy and paste from Lancaster's, which was incorrect and had false information in it. Then this resolution comes through and now we're making it political, you know, Hochul, President Biden, the White House, and now we're talking, you know, Russia and Iran and Qatar. Bottom line is it could be done in two whereas is whereas Chiktawaka does not have the infrastructure and is not ready for it right now, and then the therefore we don't support the, the governor's you know um, proposal. It, it's that simple. We're making it too complicated. We're throwing out false narratives and, and scare tactics and everything, and, and it's just making it very complicated for us as a board to vote on it, at least for me, and it's making it very complicated for the residents to understand what the heck is going to happen. Is somebody going to come in and take my gas stove or not? I don't know. They don't know. It, we're making it too complicated. I agree, and you talked about we didn't want to make this political. I saw Mr. Nowak yesterday. He's known about this for over two months, and this is my first knowledge of him trying to pass these whereas, so he had ample opportunity to address me. He brings it to the board now because it's exactly that. It's political. We had a phone call last Monday where I attempted to tell you about the word currently in the fourth whereas, and I think you heard it. And then you spoke for about 15 minutes. And that's okay. I listened to you. But I did attempt to bring right, this up to you a week ago on that phone call. Pumps. All right. So are we in favor or not of these uh, amendments here? So the well, all right. So when it comes to the regular board meeting, we'll have to take a vote on each amendment uh, and then, you know, take a vote on the final we put together. I'm just trying to discuss it ahead of time, um, you know, because of the fact that you're right, we have to make this simple. That's why I thought if we did it, I helped Council Member Jasinski do this new one, just like I got a copy of one from the Erie County Ledge. Bipartisan, they both all agreed to this resolution on the Erie County Ledge. Nobody voted no on it. The Democrats did not vote no. This is what they presented, and I thought that would be the easiest. See, I don't even think we need to keep presenting it to say, hey, the Erie County Ledge bipartisan and all that. I mean, we're not the Erie it County doesn't Ledge. Say that here. Oh, oh, no, I'm just saying that that keeps getting thrown around on why we should vote on it. I mean, I feel we should vote on it because it's the right thing to do. I don't think Chief is ready for it yet, but we just keep making it too damn political up here. Mm -hmm. but it's, it, and I mean, this is, you know, respectfully, this is a very complicated issue, and, you know, I, 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 I prefer this resolution to the first one. I think this gets closer to the mark because the first one said, the CLCPA as a whole was no good. And I had a lot of issues with that. This one here is more reasonable to say that within the scope of that law, there are some problems. And I think we can all agree to that much to get consensus on it. Uh, I mean, it, where I am on this, I'll just put up my amendments and I, I appreciate that there's support for the first two out of three. You don't get everything you want, right? So uh, I'm comfortable with taking this to the regular meeting and then mm -hmm. letting the vote fall where it will. At least on my amendments. In like I said, I'm fine with the Linda's and the two years, except that mother, that long one. I don't know where this fits in here. It's kind of contradictory. It, I think. No, That's it, my opinion. It, but I mean, it, it gets to the complication of the issue. I mean, the U.S. consumes so many of the resources in the world that we have a disproportionate impact on how some of these things happen. It just speaks to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll then take the vote at the uh, regular meeting tonight, and we have to, like I said, pose the resolution 
Madam Clerk, do you have a copy of everything so that okay. you can add them as we, we go along? Okay, so that was that. That was probably the longest one, sorry. Um, Okay, so then we, after we go through the tabled item, um, resolution one is the transfer of funds. Uh, resolution um, two is the warrant. Uh, our clerk has it up on the screen. Um, man, our uh, number three is a resolution, a notice of hearing for demolition of 1746 Dale Road. Uh, thank you, Rick Hoburn. <laughs> These, these properties have, we have to do something with them. They, you know, I know with COVID, everything was at a standstill, but we, we really have to start moving on holding our residents accountable for some of their properties, so. Um, number four is enable the Chief Tobacco Police Department to request and acquire excess Department of Defense equipment. The Chief's here, yes. or even a flood, because they seem like they can get through that too. And some of these vehicles are big enough to put, uh, like it, when you got your person in a, in a car, you could put the people in this vehicle to yeah. transport for them back, Absolutely. not like a snowmobile. Yeah, and so and that, that's what we saw. Even as we're looking, uh, you know, we've done some preliminary research in the vehicles, uh, all-terrain vehicles that we could equip uh, with like tracks to get through it. Um, you know, bare minimum, we're looking about forty thousand dollars for something that might fit. Uh, four to six people. You know, some of these big uh, armored personnel carriers, mm -hmm. you know it seems like an overkill, but um, if you were stuck in the snow blizzard on Walden Avenue uh, with no gas in your car, you don't care what the vehicle looks like that's coming to get you as long mm -hmm. as you can get in it and get out of the weather. <laughs> you know, we talked about this before and you know when we have incidents like the blizzard, you know, the, the type we were like, everybody asks where's the National Guard? why the National Guard is gonna bring a lot of the, the same type of equipment that we could get off of this list. So, I mean, sure. you know, like, you know, yeah. I, I see this and I'm like, hey, can we talk about this for yeah. a minute? But there's, this sure. makes a lot of sense for the specific purposes that we yeah, want. And, and I know that the, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, this is a national program and, and it's, it's attracted some heat due to the way that police departments have used some, some of this equipment in other jurisdictions as a way to intimidate during public unrest and things like that. Um, you know, that's it's clearly not our intention on any of this. Our intention is, you know, mostly number one for the storm response. And number two, should we have, a, you know, a critical incident where somebody is actively firing on citizens or 
law enforcement, we do have something that might be able to protect us to allow us to respond. So it would be time sensitive and waiting for another entity to yeah. come up to mm -hmm. Correct. Definitely yeah. could, I, could use that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so everybody got their questions answered about that one. Um, then uh, we're creating two senior public safety dispatcher positions for our job inventory. And um, resolution six will be the lead hazard testing services agreement. Uh, seven will be approved cultural group funding for the year 2023, which I believe is the garden club. I sent everybody their um, statements from last year. Um, so they're asking for a thousand dollars and we always support them because they do a lot of work in the community and especially do our um, War of 1812 cemetery. Okay. They really take it. Definitely going to chime in and say, even around town hall, I believe they do some work as well. If Not I'm as much, so. but like some of the nursing homes and stuff. Correct. But yeah. some of that may come down to funding available too, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe, you know, we, we look at it down the road if there's still funding available under that line item, maybe mm -hmm. they can get additional funding. To well, this is a little bit spread. more than the last year. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, 700. Sure. And they haven't asked for. Yeah more money for 10 years so yeah, they do good work around town so mm -hmm. this is good okay uh resolution eight is the upgrade emergency communications radio software system we have lisa here if anybody has any questions about any of these resolutions or lisa if you want to chime in just let me know um, resolution nine is the workflow management software annual maintenance Ten is the email archive software renewal. Eleven is the data center battery backup protection annual maintenance. Twelve is the end of life replacement of multifunction units for various departments. <coughs> and then um, we have several special events. Thirteen is a special event at the Cleveland Hill School District Triathlon. 14 is the Freedom Fest celebration. Yeah, and 14, uh, there was, if you look in the next resolution for the Polish festival, there's five points of waiving following requirements. Mm. And then one of them is requirement that application may be made at least 60 days prior. That one isn't in the Freedom Fest one, but application was already made. So I just wanna confirm with the board that that won't be an issue because to my mind, Resolution 14 is written pop properly and is fine, yeah. and that won't be an issue. But should we include it just to be safe? So, what? Uh, all right, now I got it in front of me. What are you saying is different? Yeah, if you look at 14 and 15, it's the the submittal of sanitary facilities, submittal of site plan, and then the difference is requirement that application be made at least 60 days prior. I believe application was made already. I submitted application, but I just wanted to make sure we were okay to move forward on 14 because to me the language is proper and sound. It doesn't need that addition, mm -hmm. but does anybody feel we should add it to be safe? Because it's not there like the other one. I don't think so, right, Kim? No, it's a requirement of any special event that come that is getting filed that they do it within 60 days. So you've met that requirement just by putting it in right. now. Thank you. Because I believe these have been just, we just copy and paste them from year to year, so it's been that way for a long time, so I don't think I have a problem. And then uh, 15 is the uh, 43rd annual Polish American Arts Festival. 16, authorized supervisor to sign agreement with BUSDA 2023. 17 is to um, authorize supervisor to execute agreement with the Erie County FPCA. 18 is to authorize a supervisor to execute contract for the 2023 Independence Day celebration. And then 19 is the same thing, except for the 43rd annual Polish American Festival. Then uh, resolution 20 is youth and recreation hiring. 21 is the appointment of a park maintenance worker permanent at the facilities department. 22 is the appointment of a laborer permanent in the highway. 23 is appointment of labor in the facilities department. That's a permanent Austin. 24 is appointment of a maintenance uh, worker temporary. 
Is that a maintenance worker or a park maintenance worker? Okay. Um, 25 is a travel authorization for the police, 25. And then 26 is a travel authorization for the building and plumbing department. Then uh, there are three waiver items under the suspension of rules. Uh, resolution one is um, order ap uh, resolution and order after public hearing for the sewer bonding. That, so we'll have the public hearing at the beginning of the meeting and then we have this resolution to approve this sewer bonding resolution. Uh, resolution two is a notice to bidders for the acceptance of the disposal of yard waste. And resolution three is the imposition of a fire or penalty upon LaSalle ambulance. Yeah, I wanted to speak to that one mm -hmm. briefly. The, the ambulance times for, I believe the, that deals with the month of January response times. Uh, there were four fire districts where they exceeded the eight minutes. Uh, I've not seen that too much in my five years here. I think that's, uh, it's not the first time, but it's very rare where there's so mu much excess lateness. I was at the EMS board meeting last night. They only, the AMR only exceeded eight minutes in one of the districts, and that, that happens from time to time, sometimes two. But to see this many, I, I'm glad we're finally taking this up. What period of time is it for that you saw this? The, uh, the reports are monthly, so they'll cover the, the calendar oh, the month, month from the first of the month to the, the 30th, 31st, except for February, we got the 28th, right? Yeah, so this was for January, and the other side of the coin, though, so you, you kind of see a bigger picture of it, too, is, I mean, we had AMR before us explaining some of the troubles they were facing lack of staff um, in addition to I mean the biggest problem is being held up in the hospitals and that's outside of their control so though this fine you know it, it's in the contract it was asked and recommended by the EMS board and that's where it is, it is now with be for us to vote on and say hey do we enact that and practice our right within that contract with AMR they're not surprised that this is going to come down you know the pipeline that it was right there so they were actually at the meeting when the EMS board asked for us to evaluate and put this fine forward so um, but part of it, though, is kind of understanding the other side of it is some of it's out of their control. They're stuck at the hospital for two plus yeah. hours until the patient is taken into custody by the hospital itself. So there is some complications that they face. Well, I just worry we're putting more of a hardship on AMR. If we want them to improve their services, fining them another $500 where it could go towards and salary or whatever they Correct. need to get and, and they understand that, but at the same point, uh, I had a discussion with AMR. I mean, $500 in the scheme of things, they're, they're banking $1,600 per patient to transport them. So, you know, it's, it's not a hit to their pocketbook, but it's a message sent that, hey, you know, we understand you have issues, but let's, let's work to improve them, either together or on your own. What can we do to help you? But at the same time, we're also showing that we're just not going to lay down and, and you can show up whenever you want because lives are at stake here. And that, yeah, I understand that you know the the hospitals are part of the problem, but you know we, they the ambulance company makes a contract with the town, and we count on them to respond according to that contract. Eight minutes, on average, in each of the districts through the course of the month, and they showed in February that they were able to get to all but one, and you know the month prior they missed it on four. Uh, I mean, I think doing this will get us moving in the right direction of improving service. Did they say why? Were there special circumstances? This month versus last? I mean, each with, there are so many calls that were over. I don't think one, there's one single answer to it. It's just mm -hmm. total systemic performance over the month of January, you know. Were they down a worker or did they all come in at once and they couldn't? I could let Councilman Plark speak to the staffing levels if you want to, but I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. I've heard that they're fully staffed for the town of Chituaga now, correct? Correct. They, they do have staff in that, but. Like I said, I mean, a lot of it does come down to them being caught up in the hospitals yeah, and waiting. waiting. I mean, they're literally there two plus hours, but that's just one piece of the, the, the problem. You know, there's so much more to it. Um, but they understand they're working towards it. They, they definitely have programs. They just, they just graduated, I want to say, 15 new EMS uh, oh, personnel. Um, they're not all dedicated just to Cheektowaga, though, but they are, you know, so they're making, you know, progress and, and they've got programs and incentives to sign on with AMR and that. But I, I do agree. I get it. You know, $500 could go towards the programming and, and towards incentives and stuff like that. But at the same time, we have to send the message of, hey, you also got to step up a little bit too. You know, we can't just allow this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that 
it for the resolution items. Um, we do have a need for an executive session. So I will make a motion to go into executive session to discuss PBA collective negotiations. Can we also add to that the uh, discipline of a particular employee? And add employment, uh, the history of an employment of a particular person. Employment history of a particular person. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, we'll come back at 7 o'clock. <laughs> 